Fanta Wild Asian Legendary Park, and yeah. with me is my colleague Jian Hua. Yeah, it's a theme park, and now you probably are guessing where we are right now. It, it seems gorgeous. very much like ASEAN countries, yeah. right? But the thing is, we're still in Nanning, the capital we city are. of Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region, and we have been traveling through the city through the day, right? Yes, yes, and, and now, we arrived at this yeah. amusement park. It's like a miniature uh, ASEAN country. The theme of the park is ASEAN country. So we have ten different facilities, each represent one of the ten ASEAN countries. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's beautiful later, here. we're gonna go to some of them. Of course, if you're from any of the ASEAN nations, definitely stay tuned and leave your comments on Facebook or Weibo or anywhere and we'll get back to your questions as soon as possible. Yes, this okay. park was uh, actually built to uh, celebrate the 60th anniversary mm -hmm. of the Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region. When was that? Last year, right? Yeah, something like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And also, this special program is dedicated to the 70th anniversary of the founding yes. of People's Republic of China. A little bit tongue-twisting, of course, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, anyways, for those who just tuned in, this is CGTN and this is the... Uh, Southeast route of and New China in South China. Yes, and of course later we may talk to our colleagues in those two lines, mm -hmm. northeast, northeast and, and southwest. Mm -hmm. And they're going to bring us to something quite different. We yes. are in China, We're in different Nine places, uh -huh. southeast of China. Very humid, mm. very hot. It just rained. I it can was see pouring that. half yeah. an hour ago. So thankfully the rain stopped. But it's very very humid, like Bali. It That's just feels right. like you're in Bali. It's Doesn't very much like in Bali, but I've never been there, of course. Like yeah, yeah. It's very, very hot. So it's a bit humid. Anyways, this is the south of China. It's humid in the first place. It may yeah. take you a while to get used it to does, it. It does. It does. Yeah. All right. So let, let's now go go into the park and check it out. Um, the ticket is actually, I, I asked them, and it's only 260 RMB. So that's mm -hmm. only about 40 less than 40 US dollars and that covers the entire park so 10 huge facilities indoor facilities each mm -hmm. kind of represents uh, different uh, features history, of the uh, different countries uh, histories and culture or, and yeah, myth right yeah, yeah. cultures of okay. uh, 10 different countries and and, and there are also now. a lot of outdoor uh, amusement facilities like roller coasters uh, there was a wooden Roller coaster yeah, as well. Roller here. Coaster outside the theme park, yeah. to be honest. But it that sounds, is a very unique. Sounds a and bit here scary. Here is the Water Sprinkle Festival. I think it was held sometime yeah, before we came here, right? So if we turn the cameras around, and then we're going to see different architectural styles. And this one, it's, uh, I think that is Indonesian, right? Yes, it's. Um, so right in front of this amusement park, there are 10 little kind of uh, architectures yeah. that they're either gift shops or restaurants or um, so they all represent uh, different, different countries, countries with their different, different architecture. turn the cameras thing. around, I think. So if you look at okay. this so one, got, we've got yeah, this, building, uh, this like is a, a like a thatched roof and yes. everything, right? This is Indonesia, okay. and this year is the theme of the park all year round is about mm -hmm. Indonesia. So now there's Bali, and there's somewhere. There this is Bali, else. right? No yeah, wonder we have this uh, water sprinkle festival, festival and there'll there. be something else okay. next year. This one looks. Let me turn the camera around. That one, I think that is Thailand. Very, yeah, that very golden. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we can also see some of the religious uh, signatures over there, right? Yeah. You can see some of the figurines and also elephants over there. So uh, now I think that looking. is the uh, end for our the first part. And we are going to talk to We're our We're very excited to go in right? and actually explore some okay. of the, these uh, facilities. So meanwhile... Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, of course, if you, you are guys. interested, and then stay tuned. And now let's go to, to Northeast So we are and Jeff. So tell us what you have over there. Take it over. Well, we have 12 days to tell you hundreds of stories about 70 years of new China. It's still day one, although it does feel like it's day four or five It feels already. like day 10 already. Doesn't it? it really does. We're still up in the border, uh, the far northern tip of China, up on the border with Russia. Russia is, is literally just the other side of that, that wall there. We are so close. Um, it's an amazing town, Andrew, isn't it? Definitely a very charming town. Uh, in fact, I've been to several other border cities like Dandong and Liaoning province, but I think what's unique about this place is it has such a heavy Russian influence. You can see dozens of restaurants catering to Russians, and you can see all the shops. In fact, more shopping malls than some of the American cities uh, of comparable, uh, comparable size. Yeah, but you know, you and I went shopping earlier on, and all we got at the end of it was some chocolate and some sweets. I wanted some Russian vodka. Well, Bill had enough time, and we'll go again, maybe, right after this. You're so kind to me. Okay. But I think we should cut to um, our reporter Feng Yilei who is right now at the Russian Doll Square um, 
she'll bring us some some of the coolest. Um, what have you got for us, Fung Yulai? I'm now at Manjo Lee's Russian Doll Square, and even today is a work day, and it's already a little bit freezing uh, at this. Uh, northern border town we can still see many tourists and earlier uh, i saw uh, groups of pupils probably on their autumn outing in this uh, park so actually this scenic spot this popular scenic spot consists of three different parts namely a russian doll uh, theme park some uh, entertainment facilities like roller coasters and merry-go-around and also a uh, russian doll theme hotel so today i'm joined by uh, miss Li Nan Nan, mm -hmm. uh, our tour guide, she's going to uh, show us around this place and uh, give us an idea of how it features Russian dolls in almost every way. Uh, so, Lena, say hello to our audience. Hello, 大家好,欢迎来到满洲里市桃瓦景区,俄罗斯特色风情园. So, so, as I said earlier, this theme park features Russian dolls and Russian cultures in almost every way. So, first of all, uh, behind me, we can see the tallest Russian doll-shaped buildings in the world, one in green and uh, uh, the other one in red. So, uh, they really stand out now as uh, uh, the landmark tourist attraction in Manjoli. Many may wonder what they really are when they first pass by these gigantic Russian dolls. So, uh, Nana, what, what's the answer to the questions? 就是这些东西到底是什么呢? 后面你看见这个绿色的主体套娃，它是圆套娃广场的一个主体建筑，它通高三十一米，曾在两千零七年它获得过上海的世界吉尼斯纪录、世界上最大的异形建筑群。uh, this is this this, this uh, green uh, Russian door building was the earliest uh, built Russian door building uh, in this area, and uh, it was uh, the the biggest uh, Russian door building. Uh, in uh, 2007 and uh, we can see this one is now bigger than uh, the green one so uh, what is that 这个红色的现在是不是比它更大一些它是什么时候建造的对这个是在二零一六年开始建造的它呀它是以套娃月形象的一个主题酒店通高七十二米它目前是世界上一个最大的套娃建筑它建成以后也是我们内蒙地区一
Russian Doll Workshop. So speaking of Russian Doll, it is also known as the Matryoshka Doll or the Nesting Dolls. Uh, but uh, how it became uh, a selling point in a China a Chinese tourist site? 就是套娃我们都知道是一个俄罗斯的文化形象，它是如何呃现在演变成了这样一个在中国景区的这样一个一个卖点。呃，因为套娃它最初寓意是人丁兴旺，后来被延展为亲情和友情和爱情。那套娃它在俄罗斯呃象征着你中庸我，我中庸你，在我们中国也寓意了多福多贵和多子多孙的美好祝愿。So Nana so, told us that uh, this Russian doll actually matches uh, matches perfectly with the China's tradition uh, of uh, um, the more children you have, the more blessing. Uh, the, the family will get. So here, I guess we can see uh, the procedure of uh, uh, Russian dolls making. Can you quickly So uh, here through the window, we can see the difference of uh, the traditional way of making Russian dolls and the modern way of doing that. And this is uh, a traditional tool. 就是他们怎么样把这个制作成皮是吗？啊，对，制作成套娃白皮。呃，咱在车床上车出套娃，车工必须有一些出色的手艺，因为套娃它没有固定的工具啊，大小去测量它们的形状，都是根据车工这个多
Thank you very much, Ile. Looks like you're having a lot of fun down there. We'll see you a bit later on for dinner. Uh, now, I want to bring in our guest, Professor Yi Yong, yes. who is with us for the journey. Are you feeling car sick yet? Really? Are you feeling Are you car sick yet? No, 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 yet. Not yet. Yeah. Um, this border town is pretty fascinating. Who benefits most, though, do you think? China or Russia? Um, I think in terms of the trade balance, you know, this city runs a kind of a deficit, a huge deficit, as a matter of fact, uh, with Russia. Mm. Uh, you know, China's export only account for about 12% of the total trade volume, mm. I mean, border trade volume. So uh, basically, you know, the city you know, has brought in more Russian products than export Chinese products to Russia. So it plays a very important role, actually, it also in terms of the China. Uh, Russia trade seven, nearly seventy percent of the uh, uh, bilateral trade, bilateral trade, you know, uh, passed through this uh, landmark. Well, of course, we know in general how important China trade is to Russia. How important is Russian trade to China? Uh, so far, in terms of the importance, I think you know both sides attach great importance mm -hmm. to the, I mean, the trade relations. And uh, Russia has an ambition to expand the trade relations just beyond those border cities, mm -hmm. which means they wanted to go to the southern part of China, I mean Russian products go to the mm. southern part of China. I think that is going to be the uh, driving force behind another another goal of, right. uh, of the uh, bilateral trade relations, which is, you know, 200 billion US dollars. You know, last year our trade volume was a little more than 100 billion US dollars. So we can expect to see that happening pretty and, soon. And Professor, our last question to you is, we've been talking about trade for for this whole for for this for all these hours, and we're yeah. going to talk more for the 4 p.m. show. But it's not just a trading center, right? It also yeah. has tourism going on, has a lot yeah. of people-to-people -people exchanges. Yes. What is Manjoli trying to achieve? You know, going forward, what should be its future path? Yes, I think you know they have already had a goal to make the city uh, a tourism trading center. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, people-to-people -people exchange is a big part of it. And, and that's why you see a lot of Russian business people coming to this city, right. and you also see tourists, tourists coming from the other part of the country to this place. And I believe in the future, I think it will be the increased people-to-people -people exchange. I probably that 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 effect. I mean, the cultural effect of the trading relationship will go beyond uh, what the so-called twenty-mile you know radius. And Definitely. to the other part of the country. This is all part of the key tenets for the Belt and Road Initiative, which is not just about trade infrastructure, but also about people-to-people -people exchanges. Yeah, and, and we were saying earlier on that when you look at the border control, there's a special exactly. area right. you dedicated can go to, to for the Belt, Belt and Road, Road Initiative, Road, which yeah. is fantastic. Um, most of the day, we've been driving around Manjuri very slowly, and just mm -hmm. sort of crawling around as we sort of look <laughs> at things at the moment. We will be driving a bit faster as time goes on because we're heading into the grasslands uh, very soon. But for now, let's head to the southeast and see how Li Tianhua and Michelle Vanderberg are getting on. Guys, how are you doing? Hello everyone, welcome back to the southeast once again. It's still very humid back, and we're yeah. officially in the amusement yeah. park. And, and now let's start cart. this golf cart yes. and let's uh, look around. I'm gonna to I'm gonna take you around. So if we turn the camera around out of the golf car, I think you can see some beautiful buildings. Pretty golden, very beautiful, with very exquisitely carved things on all of the roofs very and exotic. everything. Very exotic. Very exotic. Which country that is? Yeah, yeah I'm thinking. So we're joined by our guides here and also our friend Andy Mock here. Yes. Welcome once again. Great to be here. Great to be here. So what is this place? This is what kind of place? Okay, so it's Myanmar it's and Myanmar. it is what city. used to be called Burma. Yeah, yeah now it used to be called Myanmar. Burma. Yeah, because the largest population is Burmese. Uh, yeah. Okay, now it's Myanmar and now we can see this city is called the City of Pagodas, yes. right? Uh, 10, okay, 10,000 pagodas. 10,000 pagodas. I think we need to let our viewers see some of the more exotic and beautiful architecture it's, over there. This is the uh, yeah, we see. We got the okay. That is golden, right? There. It's a uh, grand. Yeah. And inside say. of it, I heard from the guy that this is like a four. It's a it's a huge theater. It's a, on, yeah. On f all four sides, there are 
uh, yeah, something like holographics, right? Yes, yeah. uh, and all four total, sides seamless, mm -hmm. totally immersive, totally right. immersive, totally immersive. Yeah. Okay, and you can get to see. Um, 就是里面的那个看，能看到什么呢？呃，他们是一个讲述的小城回来一个发发展历程。哦，然后游客的话是看到这些呃虚拟的和真实的一个穿梭的感觉。So this is very much like the development of Myanmar. The build ones, yeah, show the history and the like the build ones Roman of Myanmar, right? Yeah, and I think to me, what's really exciting about this is that it's a hybrid of the traditional culture, but also using high tech to create this simulation. Uh, that gives you this immersive, almost virtual reality-like reality reality experience. So yeah. outside is all about the structures and architecture, yeah. but when it and comes inside, inside, you have something that's really inside. High tech. <laughs> okay, high tech, high tech and everything for China's secret sauce. That's right. Yes, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, oh, that okay. is uh, Uncle Wat, right? Yes, it's okay. a miniature Uncle Wat. It is a quite a mysterious Very city, actually. Like yeah, let's move the camera. It's out of the golf car. Two meters away. Yeah. You feel like what is you're it? in a different world. That is very beautiful. Uh. uh huh. And this place, we can see yeah, statues everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. okay, so this side, they have very smiley expressions. And on the other oh, side, face, totally. <laughs> very angry. So serious. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. oh. That is okay. quite, yeah, this is very much like it's Buddhism, telling right? telling the world uh -huh. to treat everything with a smile. That's right. Yeah. I think it's that's the beauty of this theme park, right? In different countries, different parts of it, and then you have different cultures. It's beautiful. And all very, uh, they want you to be kind. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it reminds mm. me a little bit of Borbodor in Indonesia mm. for some reason. It's very... That's right. Yeah. yeah. But it's I think like more normal. generally, too, this makes me think of Epcot Center in the United yeah. States. Mm -hmm. But in a way, uh, perhaps even the next step or the next generation, because it really just distills the essence mm -hmm. of each of these Southeast Asian countries. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So visitors here can quickly, without having to spend, you know, whatever, thousands, thousands tens of thousands of yeah, RMB to, to travel, places. you can quickly really get the essence have, of these countries. Have a feel of how each country is like. Yeah, that's just right. In, uh, just a day or two. It's现在也是拥有的目前非常大的一块巨型屏幕长达有六十米的一个巨型屏幕 Alright, uh -huh. so there's a 60 meter long I think we're going there. screen we'll, we'll come back to this And we're going back to this place, it's yes. very interesting of course, stay tuned uh -huh. 讲述的也是吴哥窟的一个建造的一个历程它是如何建造出来的 然后到它在被世人发现的这么一个历史 okay. So okay. it tells the story how oh, we say Uncle Walt was like established in the first place, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. then it was excavated, and it's still a quite mysterious city, right? Yes. Well, my understanding uh -huh. is that it started as a Hindu temple, yeah. right. uh, and then because I guess the hybrid because, of the country right. mm -hmm. became Buddhist, mm -hmm. and it's the biggest. Uh, yeah. religious structure in the world, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Right. That is very interesting. I think we're going back definitely to yeah. this place to have a look. Yeah. If you're interested, stay tuned, of course, after we, it comes back to us once again, right? Yeah. So now, let's uh, check in with our colleague in Southwest, probably, and then see what they have over there. And after we come back, we're going to go to that place you saw just now. It's about Uncle Wat. Uncle Wat. Okay, yeah. very beautiful place. Stay okay. tuned for that. Stay tuned for See that. See you soon. See you soon. Welcome to our digital live stream across our platforms, including our CGT and mobile uh, mobile app, the Chinese Weibo, as well as a, uh, as well as our CGT and Facebook and YouTube pages. Um, I'm Tao Yuan, and this is my brilliant uh, colleague Sean and Caleb. Together, we're on a bus driving from the city of Sunyi to Guiyang, which is the provincial capital of southwest China's Guizhou province. So far, it's been a good journey. Yeah, it's, it's supposed to be about a three-hour drive. Uh, but in terms of kilometers, it's not terribly far, so it gives you an idea that the roads aren't the best of conditions. Although, look, look right now, this is what we're dealing with. And, uh, 
uh, how you want. I think it's been you know, a pretty comfortable drive so far. It's a, a time we've been able to get out of the rain from Zoom. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I think the weather actually cleared up a little bit. Good. If we can see the, uh, the road ahead, the road that we're driving on ahead, we can see blue sky and beautiful clouds. For our international viewers, tell them a bit about the terrain, how rugged it is, uh, and it's really characterized by punching holes in mountains for, for tunnels and also bridges, just amazing bridges. Right, so for the past more than three and a half years, I've been stationed in China Southwest covering stories for CGTN from this part of the country. So I travel to Guizhou a lot, and this is a landlocked province located in the remote mountainous region in China, and GDP per capita wise is probably uh, one of the poorest provinces in China, uh, but it's also one of the fastest growing provinces in China because there's just huge potential here. And you talked about the, the, the trip that we're on right now, the boat. A reminder to our audience out there that the, you see uh, the footage might get a little bit shaky. That's because we are located in, in a very rugged mountainous area uh, in southwest part of China. And uh, the terrain here, like you said before, is just... But it, it is into the economic growth and really what this area uh, has to offer. So Mr. Uh, Victor Gao Zhikai and Mr. Chen Jiahe, those two guys, they have been with us this whole day. And thank you guys so much for being such good sport. You know, we have a really tight schedule. But thank you for being with us and sharing your thoughts with us. So how's the journey been so far? It's the first day that we're doing this um, New China 7 year on special coverage. How has it been for you guys so far? It's breathtaking. I think I like it tremendously. And uh, this is my second time in Guizhou City. First time in uh, Zhuyi, and uh, everything I saw so far really impressed me. And I think we are driving through mountain after mountain, valley after valley. And uh, Guizhou province is mostly mountainous areas. Uh, more than 85% of the terrain is mountainous. And uh, so it's, it's a landlocked, surrounded by five other provinces and municipalities. And traditionally, transportation is very, very difficult. But now you see over the past 10 years or 20 years, they've built up uh, highways and railways and airports, for example. So I think connectivity has been improved very significantly. It's a truly uh, great achievement for the province. And one thing, that, Victor, that I've enjoyed, I feel being from D.C., we've talked uh, back and forth across the ocean, but it seems like you're quite enjoying pointing things out to me uh, that, as an outsider, I wouldn't normally recognize the kerosene for farmers, the way this region is really characterized by the small family farm as opposed to what we see in large of scale the, industrial farms. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just now, as I pointed out for Schwab, there were quite precipitous drop-offs you see the valleys down, and you see family houses, for example, and very small-scale family farming, probably unseen anywhere else in the United States, for example. But this is how the Chinese farmers thrive for centuries in this part of the country. And I think such small-scale family farming probably will continue for many days to come. So, as we were just discussing amongst ourselves before we went live, this is actually the only province in China without any plains. So, the geography here is actually quite interesting. A lot of mountains, hills, canyons, valleys. And that's why Guizhou is called the hometown for bridges. That's one interesting fact about Guizhou province is that it's got some of the world's highest bridges. And one bridge actually earned its own name, the, the world's highest bridge, the Bay Time Jam Bridge. We actually have a little clip on it. Well, then let's take a look. Connecting the borders of Guizhou and Yunnan to mountainous provinces in southwest China. Bei Panjiang Bridge, the world's highest bridge, opened to traffic on December 29, 2016. The bridge deck sits 565 meters, or 1,854 feet above ground. Or in this case, the Beipan River, which the bridge is named after. That's as high as a 200-floor building. 
Meanwhile, the four-lane roadway bridge spans 1,341 meters in length. People now spend just on over an hour traveling from Liu Panshui City in Guizhou to Xuanwei City in Yunnan, compared to a more than four-hour drive previously. The Beipanjiang Bridge is part of the Hangzhou to Raili Expressway, which links Hangzhou City in eastern China's Zhejiang Province with the China to Myanmar border crossing in Yunnan's Raili City. The Steel Trust Cable State Suspension Bridge has a main span of 720 meters, currently the second longest in the world. The bridge took the lead in adopting the 500 megapascal high-strength steel bars in its design, most commonly used in developed countries such as Europe and the U.S. Its consumption of 126,000 tons of steel has resulted in cost and energy savings as well as emissions reduction. The Beipanjiang Bridge cost 1.03 billion yuan, or over 140 million U.S. dollars, to build. In May of 2018, it won the Gustav Lindenthal Medal, dubbed the Nobel Prize of Bridges, at the 35th International Bridge Conference. Four months later, it was certified by the Guinness World Records. That's an amazing bridge there. This whole drive, this whole region, to me, has been breathtaking. And we were talking about it being kind of isolated and, and suffering economically. But uh, Mr. Chen, there, there's positive news. I mean, the bar was was pretty low, but right now this province is economically improving at a greater rate than the rest of China and really almost any place else around the globe. Why is that? Well, because first of all, Guizhou is not developing uh, to an extent that you can see Shanghai or Beijing is. I mean, the per capita GDP here is about 50 or 40 percent of Shanghai, so it's really no place to start this. The second place, thanks to the United uh, China, I mean, if it's separated into nations, uh, Guizhou would have to face competition from places like Shanghai. You, you wouldn't expect if Shanghai is another country, Guizhou is another country, and we build a big data here. I mean, people would go to uh, larger cities. But big data uh, like、uh, Guizhou is currently having on its schedule is one thing that really fits for the province because、uh, if you look at the Guizhou province, it doesn't really have great transportation, but、uh, it got a lot of power. And big data needs a lot of power and cheap labor and stuff like that. So I mean, Guizhou probably can work itself to toward the example set by the Silicon Valley in, in the United States, which you know back 50 years ago Silicon Valley was nothing. That was only Silicon. So now it's really developed. Data services, cloud services, for example, and that's I think,、uh, if I'm wrong, Mr. Chen can correct me,、uh, is one reason why there is so much attraction for big internet companies、right. try to flock into this province to build up data center and、uh, cloud services. Once again, just to remind people where we are, what we're doing. This is our our、uh, new China experience across all our platforms, and we are right now. On a bus, winging our way from Zhejiang to Lei Yang. Lei Yang. Lei Yang. This is trouble. I'll get it. I'll get it. Thanks. Get it.、Yeah. So,、um, but look at the scenery. Look out there. This is what we're getting to see.、Uh, some cloud cover, as you're going to get. I think we might be on the G60. Is this it? We haven't been told yet. We haven't been. 
we no, we are probably not on that highway yet. But right? ahead, it's the Shanghai. It's the Shanghai Kunming Highway, right? Yeah. Tell me the significance of that. The highway. Right. I mean, why is that so important to this area? Well, I would say over the past one or two decades, China has developed a great deal of engineering skills in building up bridges, tunnels, and highways. And as a result, the improvement in connectivity in the country, especially in a very terrain-wise challenging province like Beijing, has been improving significantly. So when we look out at the region, we see lots of high bridges, cross canyons, for example, which were which were unheard of several decades ago. And the uh, highway you mentioned from Shanghai all the way to Kunming. In the southwestern corner of China, bordering with Myanmar, it probably is one of the longest highways in China, and it traveled east to the west across the uh, Guizhou province. But in terms of uh, what China really has to offer right now, Mr. Chen, it's it's an exploding middle class. People that have money to spend, and it's why the economy is growing. How do you see the future of this province? Is it going to continue to make leaps? Yeah, definitely. I mean, traditionally, Guizhou was building on its uh, traditional businesses. I mean, look at Mao Tai. Mao Tai has been there for hundreds of years. Just, uh, just so our Western yeah, audience know what we're talking about, the yeah. spirit. Yeah, it, 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 Mao Tai spirit has actually been one of the eight most famous spirits back on the eighth. At 1949, that that's one of the most famous spirits, but that's a traditional thing. So previously, Guizhou was doing everything on its own tradition: the the food, the the, the spirits, the, the mining, even its hydropower. Hydropower is based on the water、uh, utility that you got here. But in the future, Guizhou, I think, will attract more resources from other provinces you know, around the country, the Asian countries as well, southeastern、uh, uh, Asian countries. That's because nowadays you have transportation, you have digital highway as well. And you also have a lot of support from the central government. That's very important. Right, that's very impressive. So I think we're running out of time, guys. But just a reminder: we're trying. Welcome back 
to the Fanta Wild Yay. Asian Legendary Park. Welcome back again. It's us again, right? So it's a large group of people right now. Yeah. You can see it was a beautiful dance just now. Probably they can yeah. do it again, I right? I loved it. Okay, so we have our guests. I guess. Okay, and, once and our again. guide as well here. Okay, that is very beautiful. Yeah. They're going to do it again, right? Show us where again. we are. Okay, so where we are right now, this is Uncle Wat. I think yeah. if you have ever been it's there. A miniature Uncle yeah. Wat. Miniature, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Okay, the minimized version of it, but yeah. still... And tell us a little thing. bit about it. Well, you know, even the miniature version of Angkor Wat is still pretty big because yeah. those of us that have been to Cambodia know that Angkor Wat is the largest religious complex in the world. And it's one of the oldest as well. Started out as a Hindu temple, but I think because of the ruler of the Khmer Empire became Buddhist. So now I guess it's considered a hybrid or primarily a Buddhist uh, religious uh, place. Oh, okay. okay. Very nice. interesting. Very interesting. The Buddhism tranquility. Yeah. yeah. And the mix of the dancing, the very ASEAN style dancing. Yeah. It's truly amazing. It's so I'm really it's curious about, you know, the golden, the golden color used in, in their hat, in yeah. their, you know, decoration, so ornament. Uh, 主要是在我们柬埔寨呢，它是一个仙女舞，这支舞蹈叫做仙女舞。So okay. okay. in Cambodia, this is called a goddess dance, Gong Fairy Goddess Dance. This is like a in the in the in the palace. That's how that's where they dance. So there's a lot of restrictions on their clothing and their headpieces. So why is it gold? In the palace, gold means royalty. Also means elegance. The bottom, they're yeah, so tell us something about the dance once again, because, yeah, we just asked you to do it once again, very beautiful. Okay, and I can see the little moves, the hand gestures and everything, and they are totally barefoot, of course. So tell us something about the dance we're looking at once again right here. Hello. 这个舞蹈呢首先刚才我说了一个是从他的动作方面还有一个是从他的服装方面那么接下来我们说一下他的动作题材这个舞蹈的动作呢它是通过运用这个柬埔寨的传统特色的一些动作来进行作为这个动作
，觉得 OK， 嗯，做的非常漂亮，嗯，差一点点达到我们国家的效果。Almost the same， 但是更多的是给建议，因为毕竟是一个东盟性的国家，我们也是一个东盟十国十里面的一个，作为相互的一个呃协助。既然这里是我们大家的一个文化传递者，在这个地方，那他肯定是很愿意来跟我们交流、交流与沟通这些。They're very happy to come and communicate with us about their culture. So they give a lot of suggestions and encouragement. Add a little bit to that, but actually talking to our tour guide earlier, she was telling us that in fact there are many Vietnamese that come here because of course Guangxi Duong is borders Vietnam, and there are many students now, Vietnamese students that come to China to study, and they also come here to relax and to have a good time. Okay. So it's not only here, Vietnam, mm -hmm. or many other countries, yeah. right? It's a great place to show, to, to yeah. present to uh, Chinese people right. different cultures of the mm -hmm. ASEAN countries and also to uh, also attract ASEAN tourists. That's great. Yeah. I can feel yeah. that our Chinese friends, the tour guides, or other you know, working staff are really proud of you know, mm -hmm. having this platform as Nanning is the permanent platform sure. of the China ASEAN Expo. Right. Yeah. That's and right. We already can see the people, people exchange. Uh -huh. right. mm. And our crew, they're all really excited to be here. Yeah. They cannot right. wait I to actually go inside to all exactly. these facilities and That's actually right. experience all the fun tech stuff themselves. Mm. And also, you cannot wait either, right? You right. Really I hope we have that. time so to explore shows, some activities yeah. Yeah. together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and explore all of that. What, what are you most excited to go and I try? Heard, I heard there is a soaring project where we can, you know, use the three, a 4D technology. Yes. So can we can have a bird view yes. of all the ASEAN countries, including the China. In, in, some yeah. features of like, like the Great War and the combination mm -hmm. of some other features so, of, from other countries. So yeah. you can feel you're on top of things, but you're not, not actually on top yeah, of things. That's, that's my favorite because I cannot <laughs> do roller coasters. That's what we call bird view. So yeah. that, that, that's good. So you yeah. just feel like Let's that. Let's do that fly later. No, probably we can rock it. Right yeah. yeah, we're going to do that. Okay, I think okay. that does the uh, Is that all the time edition. we have? Okay, yeah. all right. Of sure. our special program here. And this is New China. New China. Yeah, the second version of the real-time China. Yeah, we have year. three routes. Oh, southeast, great. southwest, and northeast. We're going through all of China. So yeah. we'll bring you live shows on new media in all our uh, new media platforms and also on TV twice a day. And mm -hmm. three, times, uh, three times a day on TV and two times on new media. Yeah, definitely. Stay tuned. Of course, we are the southeast route, yes. and tomorrow we are Nanyin. heading to the next place, more beautiful, of course, I would say. And, and stay tuned. We have two more shows coming: four o'clock, uh, four p.m. on TV, mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, eight fifteen p.m. on TV. So 8 15, we'll be back. Yeah, the China we'll time, back. right? Yes, yeah. China time. We'll be back mm -hmm. with more from yeah. Nanning, Guangxi, uh, Zhuang Autonomous Region. Yes, definitely. If you like our post, please share it with your friends, and don't forget to give it. Give us a little heart. And yeah, that's all for us, right? All okay, bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.